For this module, we're going to talk about individuals who commit multiple murder or mass murderers. The killing of multiple victims is classified according to variables such as time intervals between killings, locations, and number of people killed. Typically, they are broken down into three categories, mass murder, spree murder, and serial murder. As you can see from the chart, one thing that differentiates a serial killer from a mass murderer and spree murderer is a cooling off period, having multiple events in multiple locations. In 2005, the FBI decreased the minimum number of victims to be considered a serial killer from three to two. All of these categories can be further divided based on the killer's motivation, relationship to victims, types of weapons used, and degree of organization. Let's begin by talking about mass murderers, which is described as a single act of violence that occurs at one time and in one place. This is also known as a rampage murderer and includes several different types, including disciple killers, family annihilators, pseudo commandos, school shooters, disgruntled employees, and set and run killers. It is important to note that certain killers can fall into more than one category, so they are not meant to be considered mutually exclusive. With regard to disciple killers, Charles Manson and his followers are a perfect example. Manson was the leader and instructed his followers to kill people that he selected to be victims for what he called Helter Skelter, which he took from a Beatles song. For the people who actually commit the murder, the motivation is typically external to them because they are not the ones selecting the victims. They are basically brainwashed or convinced that they must commit the murder for some sort of psychological gain which is typically to gain acceptance by the leader. The next category of mass murder is family annihilator. This is a person who kills their entire family at one time. Most often the victims are immediate family members as opposed to distant relatives and ends with the perpetrator committing suicide. This is also known as familicide. As for motivation to commit such an act, the motivation typically lies within the psychological world of the killer. In other words, it is not typically due to an external factor such as a fight or a disagreement. Some of the reasons can include feeling spiteful or vengeful, such as the man who kills his kids and his wife when his wife files for divorce, it could be due to a twisted act of mercy, which would be the person who believes that if they commit suicide, then they won't be able to care for their family. So they illogically convince themselves that the only way to care for their family is to kill them too. Of course, there is always the possibility of mental illness, which was the reason behind Andrea Yates murdering her children. Of all mass murder categories, this is the category that is most likely to end in suicide for the perpetrator. A Washington, D.C. mother has been found guilty of killing all four of her daughters and keeping their bodies inside her home. This was the scene 18 months ago. Investigators wheeling the badly decomposed bodies of four girls out of their row house. Now their mother, 34-year-old Benita Jacks, is facing life in prison on murder and child cruelty charges. This is very sad. Nobody comes out of this courthouse happy and bring these kids back. U.S. Marshal deputies stumbled upon the mummified bodies while carrying out an eviction back in January of 2008. According to local TV station WJLA, the medical examiner later determined the girls had been dead for seven months. Evidence showed the youngest girls, who ranged in age from 11 to 5, were strangled. Experts say the oldest one, 16-year-old Brittany, was stabbed, but it's not clear if that's what killed her. The judge who decided the case says he is certain about one thing when it comes to the teenager. The torture she experienced at the hands of her mother played a role in her death. No one's
seems to know what drove Jax to murder her children, but it seems that she was extremely depressed over the death of her boyfriend and father of her six- and five-year-old. The public defenders representing Jax say they will appeal Wednesday's decision. Her sentencing is scheduled for October. Carla Bradley, The Associated Press. In contrast, the pseudo-commando seeks revenge and wants to teach the world a lesson, in a general sense. Sometimes they want to live in history, even if it is only infamously. They become obsessed with power at its most basic form and want people to know who they are. Over time, they become more and more frustrated with the world and their position in it, which eventually leads them to lose grasp on what is real. These types of killers tend to be male and loners and typically share a preoccupation with weapons. When the killer is young or an adolescent, they tend to be in pairs and have higher rates of bullying. The Columbine shooting by Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold are examples of this. As for disgruntled employees, they typically retaliate due to a perceived injustice. The word perceived is very important here because it doesn't really matter if they were actually wronged in some way. Rather, it only matters what they perceive because that is what determines how they act. These killers are typically older in age with an average age of 39 compared to 29 years old. They also tend to be white males. As for school shooters, they tend to have idiosyncratic personality features and reactionary patterns to campus life. American society is steeped in beauty, attraction, popularity, and social status. Males who are unattractive and who have few or no compensatory skills are continuously subjected to frustration, so social isolation, and rejection, especially from women and other who appear to be part of a certain social clique found on campus. Similar to other categories, set and run killers are also motivated by revenge, but they don't typically end up in suicide. These killers often go to great lengths to proc procure their escape and usually don't observe the consequences of their actions. Sometimes copycat murderers will use this technique to cover up other murders. Overall, this type of killer may have particular victims in mind, but they also don't mind killing innocent people in the process. John Kaczynski, also known as the Unabomber, is an example of a set and run killer. When it comes to mass murderers, there is definitely a public perception that no one saw it coming, that there were absolutely no signs that this individual could have caused harm. However, that is not true. In the majority of cases, the mass murderer gave signs of what was to come, but people didn't take it seriously, or most likely didn't want to believe it could be true. Let's look at the Fort Hood shooting as an example. There are also some other good examples in your book of the Virginia Tech shooter, Charles Whitman, and James Huberty. Nadal Malik Hassan was reportedly a loner who socialized little with fellow officers. He expressed strong views about U.S. involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan and apparently did not want to deploy to Afghanistan. The 39-year-old major allegedly exchanged numerous emails with radical Muslim cleric Anwar Al-Laki in the year prior to the shootings asking Al-Laki about jihad and whether it was acceptable to kill American soldiers Hassan struck some of his classmates as a ticking time bomb, whose strange personality telegraphed trouble long before he allegedly killed 13 people at Fort Hood. Hassan was asked pointedly if he considered Sharia law to transcend the Constitution of the United States, and he answered yes. He was asked if homicidal bombers were rewarded for their acts with 72 virgins in heaven, and he responded, I've done the research, yes. 
those comments he made in front of a class. Hassan's classmate at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland, recalled one class during which Hassan gave a presentation justifying homicide bombing, bombings. Reports from colleagues at Walter Reed suggested Hassan had, quote, had problems in his residency with discipline and problems interacting with patients, end quote. Hassan told his classmates and professors, quote, I'm a Muslim first, and I hold the Sharia, the Islamic law, before the Constitution of the United States, end quote. Once when his classmates were giving presentations in an environmental health class on topics like soil and water contamination and the effects of mold, Hassan got up in front of the class and began to speak about his chosen topic, Is the War on Terror a War on Islam? Hassan's anti-American rant continued for two years as he worked toward his degree in public health. Hassan would stand there in uniform and pledge allegiance to the Quran. A classmate of Hassan said he witnessed at least three oral presentations by Hassan over the course of a year that focused on the morality of Muslims, war, and justification for suicide bombers. The classmate stated, quote, People were giving presentations on air quality and water quality, but he'd be full of psychobabble about how the persecution of Muslim justifies suicide bombers, end quote. After a while, Hassan's classmates would just roll our eyes saying, here we go again. A classmate of Hassan's also complained about Hassan leaving lessons to pray. He'd disrupt class by sitting in front and leaving for prayer. When one of us asked him to please sit back in the class so it wouldn't disrupt the rest of us when he left, he just looked at him with scorn. In the months before the shooting, Hassan tried reaching out to people associated with Al-Qaeda and did so under the watchful eye of at least one U.S. intelligence agency. An intelligence official told FoxNews.com that, quote, Hassan was on our radar for months, end quote. Even though Hassan had a bad performance review while working at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, he was promoted to major. Even though he had made concerning comments in front of the class, an investigation was never triggered. When an officer was asked why Hassan was still in the Army, he was told, quote, political correctness squelched an opportunity to confront him, end quote. When investigators asked a classmate why he didn't file a complaint against Hassan, he responded with, quote, Sir, why would I have to when the faculty heard all of the things firsthand? End quote. It was speculated that the military didn't want to say anything because it would be questioning somebody's religious belief or would trigger an equal opportunity lawsuit. Hassan's classmates said they cut him slack because he didn't scare them. An intelligence official told foxnews.com that Hassan was on our radar for months. The DOD report indicated that several officers failed to comply with policies regarding the alleged perpetrator. Several medical officers failed to include the alleged per perpetrator's overall performance as an officer, rather than solely his academic performance in his formal performance evaluation. Hassan held an active secret security clearance, but the background investigation did not include a subject interview with coworkers, supervisors, or expanded character references. The Department of Defense did not appear to have a formal policy for guidance for commanders to identify, report, or act on indicators that may relate to an internal threat. So as you can see, there were obviously signs well before the shooting at Fort Hood happened. There is also another case, Jared Lothner, who shot Congresswoman Kathy Gifford in Arizona. 22-year-old Lothner made previous threats to kill, but not specifically against Miss Giffords. Lothner's MySpace page included a mysterious goodbye friends message published just hours before the shooting, stating, quote, please don't be mad at me, end quote. On one of several YouTube videos, Lofner described inventing a new U.S. currency and complained about the illiteracy rate 
among people living in Miss Gifford's congressional district in Arizona. Loeffner attempted to enlist in the Army, but was rejected for service after failing a drug test. Loeffner's posting included a number of bizarre anti-government messages. In a video, Loeffner calls the district, the people of District 8, his Arizona district, illiterate. Loeffner posts that as an example of deductive reasoning. He concludes that, quote, the police are unconstitutional, end quote. Loeffner lists reading under interests as well as conscious dreams and among his favorite books are Mein Kampf, The Communist Manifesto, Animal Farm, and Brave New World. In a comment posted on MySpace three months prior to the shootings, Loeffner wrote, quote, The school is breaking the Constitution. The United States Constitution, which is the law, can be broken at this school. End quote. Loeffner's biology teacher at a community college called 911 after a classroom confrontation, confrontation with him. When told he would get half credit on a paper turned in late, he started ranting about, quote, taking away his individual rights, that it was unconstitutional, end quote. The rant continued for so long that the teacher asked the campus police to come and calm him down. Loeffner had five contacts with campus police and ultimately was suspended on September 29th after campus police found a YouTube video in which he claimed that the college was illegal under the U.S. Constitution. The college told Loeffner if he intended to return to school, he would have to get a clearance from a mental health worker indicating that he would, quote, not present a danger to himself or others, end quote. Officials said after this letter, they had no further contact with him. So what gets in the way of stopping the behavior? Why don't people notice the signs? One reason is denial, believing that it just couldn't be, or it couldn't happen here. Another reason is rationalization, which happens when people insert just into the behavioral description. For example, he was just ranting on Facebook. By saying that, you are rationalizing someone's behavior. Other reasons for discounting the behavior is by believing in urban legends, such as the person just snapped, or believing that we really knew who a person was because they followed basic rules of society. As discussed earlier, people don't just snap. There are usually plenty of warning signs. Another reason behaviors are discounted are because people focus on the who instead of the what. Instead of focusing on the fact that a particular individual is making very inappropriate and disturbing statements, the focus changes to the who, which can include if they have a mental health diagnosis, their ethnicity, gender, religious affiliation, or other affiliations. As with the case was with the Fort Hood shooter, people focused on the who, the fact that he was Muslim, instead of focusing on the fact that he was openly supporting the use of suicide bombings. Other reasons include being afraid to do anything because they might set the person off. They might not act violently if you don't do anything. Or assuming that the potential perpetrator is getting help because he or she is in counseling. That's assuming that the person that he's in counseling with has any idea. Afraid of a lawsuit or other legal action. Applying the extinction theory to violence. That it'll just, just burn out. It'll just eventually wear out. Or over-reliance on risk assessment instruments instead of behavioral observations and data monitoring. All right, let's move on and talk about spree killing. This is defined as the killing of three or more people without a cooling off period that takes place at more than one location. Most often spree killers operate in pairs, such as the DC snipers or also known as the beltway snipers. 
With regard to the amount of time between killings, the timing is typically sporadic as opposed to waiting a specific amount of time in between each killing. One of the most famous spree killers was the duo Bonnie and Clyde, who committed 13 murders and several robberies across America between 1932 and 1934. But how do spree killers really differ from serial killers? What is a sufficient enough period of time for a cooling off period? Well, it turns out that the categories aren't helpful to law enforcement in any way, so the FBI has eliminated the spree murder category altogether. This brings us to the category of serial killers. Let's see how much you already know about serial killers. Factor myth. Most serial killers are reclusive loners. This is a myth. Most serial killers live functional lives and often have solidified relationships. Factor myth. Serial killing is a white person thing. Eh, this is both. It actually mirrors the racial breakdown of the United States. Factor myth. There is always sexual motivation behind the killings. This is a myth. There are many motives behind killings, which we'll talk about in just a second. And serial killers can't stop. This is a myth. There are several serial killers that stop altogether before they're actually caught. As we just talked about, it is hard to define a cooling off period. One pe way people try to differentiate serial killing is that the cooling off period was months or years that the person went back to living normal life. In other words, this entire period was not spent trying to plan their next attack. The typical age for a serial killer's first murder is 29 for males and 30 for females. Also, serial killers tend to have about average intelligence with some having above average intelligence, such as Ted Bundy, who had a reported IQ of 136, and the Unabomber, who had a reported IQ of 165. And as you can see in this chart, it resembles the racial breakdown of the United States. The FBI has created a psychological profile of a serial killer, which includes Caucasian male between the ages of 18 and 32 who has been the victim of child abuse and who has exhibited signs of the McDonald triad, which is bedwetting after the age of 12, setting fires, and killing small animals. Of course, this is just a profile of who they believe to be the typical serial killer. With regard to the McDonald triad, most serial killers exhibit at least one of these behaviors. According to Robert Ressler, more than 60% of serial killers wet the bed past the age of 12. The son of Sam, or David Berkowitz, set almost 1,500 fires, but switched over to killing because it gave him more excitement in TV news coverage than arson. Keith Jesperson, a serial killer from British Columbia who murdered more than 160 victims, started with dozens of cats and other small animals before he moved on to human beings. Some of these cases are what have supported the McDonald triad. Serial killers tend to be male, but there have been some infamous female serial killers. Overall, they are rare and tend to have some sort of relationship with the victim. Female serial killers are also more likely to use low profile or covert methods of killing, such as poison. One of the most notable exceptions to these rules was Eileen Warnos, who killed seven men in Florida in between 1989 and 1990, claiming they raped or attempted to rape her while she was working as a prostitute. She was convicted and sentenced to death 
for six of the murders and executed by lethal injection on October 9th, 2002. The movie Monster, starring Charlize Theron, was based on her life. And this is a quote from Eileen. I robbed them, and I killed them cold as ice, and I know I would kill another person because I've hated humans for a long time. Serial? With regard to the comment that a serial killer has suffered childhood abuse, Research has found that the majority, majority of serial killers grew up in dysfunctional families with histories of abuse, neglect, and domestic violence. This chart shows you the breakdown between the percentage of serial killers who suffered childhood abuse versus the percentages experienced in the general popula population. And as you can see, they are quite a bit higher. In this video, we're going to hear a little bit of Jeffrey Dahmer's take on developmental issues and suffering abuse in childhood, which is actually quite interesting. I feel it's uh, wrong for people who commit crimes to try to shift the blame onto somebody else, onto their parents or onto their, their upbringing or, certain, or living circumstances. I, I think that's just a, a cop out. And uh, my parents and my relatives had no knowledge of what I was doing are absolutely not responsible for any of it in any way and uh, I take full responsibility but you, under but you understand that, that what you did would lead your father to ask himself all kinds of questions that's true where, where did I go wrong was there something I could have said or done to have prevented this right. did I in some way create or contribute to the terrible acts my son committed I understand that. I, I just get uh, angry with other people who, who think that uh, they have a right to, uh, to somehow try to blame my parents for what happened. That's not right at all. No one has the right to do that because they're totally innocent. They have no knowledge of it. And uh, that angers me. But parents just naturally, I mean, any parent that really cares, they just... First of all, say, I, gee, I feel guilty. You know, I, there's just feelings of guilt. What happened? What did I do? What could I have done? So that's a normal parental reaction. Your dad has wondered about all kinds of things, from the medication that your mom was on during her pregnancy to the fact that you were exposed to violent arguments in the home from an early age and continuing to the possibility that he might have passed on some genetic propensity for obsession or violent behavior. Does any of that ring true in you? I can see why you'd wonder about those things, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're all excuses. Because I didn't feel accountable to anybody. I didn't feel that I had to to uh, face what I had done ever. And uh, so you, you have, there comes a point where a person has to has to be accountable for what he's done. You can't go can't go around making excuses, uh, blaming other people other things. So I, I alone am the one who's responsible for what's happened. Let me ask, when did you first feel that, that everyone is accountable for their actions? Well, thanks to you for, for sending uh, that uh, creation science uh, material. Because I always, I always believe the, uh, the lie that the evolution is truth, the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came from uh, the slime, and uh, when, we, when we died, you know, that was it. There was nothing. So uh, the whole theory cheapens life, and uh, started reading books about how, that show how evolution is, is just a complete lie. There's, there's, no, there's no basis in science to, to uphold it, and I've come to, since come to believe that uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the true creator of uh, the heavens and the earth. It just didn't just happen. And uh, I have accepted him as my Lord and Savior. And I believe that I, as, long, as well as everyone else, will be accountable to him. Growing up, did you feel that you were accountable to your dad or to your mom as the authority? Yes, I did. You were in the house? Yes, I did. 
I mean, they, they didn't let me uh, run wild. They were, they disciplined me. And uh, so I felt accountable to them. But afterwards, after I left the home, that's, that's when I uh, started wanting to uh, sort of create my own little world where I could be the one who had the complete control, where I didn't have to uh, bow to anyone else's demands. And uh, I just took it way too far. But at that period of time, I had drifted away from a belief in the supreme being. And I never, as a result, passed along the feeling that we are all accountable in the end. He owns us. And that basic concept is very fundamental to all of us. You feel that the absence, at least for a while, of a strong religious faith or belief for some years may have prevented you from instilling some of that, Jeff. That's right. Is that how you feel? Yes, I think I had a big, uh, big part to be able to do with it. I mean, uh, if you don't, if a person doesn't think that there, there is a God to be accountable to, then that what's, what's the point of, of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? And that's how I thought anyway. And uh, I've since come to believe that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is truly God. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're the only true God. In 1988, Joel Norris classified seven phases that serial killers tend to go through. Note, not all serial killers go through all of these phases, if any, and they do not have to go in the same order. He conducted over 500 individuals, interviews with over 500 individuals, Ian found that these phases were in common among all of the killers. The killers began with an aura phase, in which there is a withdrawal from reality and a heightened of the senses. This phase may last anywhere from several moments to several months and can begin as a prolonged fantasy, which may have been active for a short time or for years. The killer may attempt to medicate himself with alcohol or drugs, the trolling phase consists of the behavior patterns that a particular killer uses to identify and stalk his victim. The wooing phase is the time period when most killers win the confidence of victims before luring them into a trap. Norris described how Ted Bundy strapped his arm in a sling and asked for help with books, packages, or even the hull of a sailboat to lure the victim into his car. Some victims escaped and said he never seemed out of control in the mo until the moment he actually attacked them. The capture phase may include the locking of a door or a blow that renders the victim helpless. This can be done by any means possible. Dahmer enticed victims to have a drink, which was a drug-laced cocktail. The killer savors this moment. Norris described the murder phase as the ritual reenactment of the disastrous experiences of the killer's childhood. But this time he reserves, reverses the roles. The next phase Norris described is the totem phase. After the kill, murderers sink into a depression, so many develop a ritual to preserve their success. This is why some killers keep news clippings, photographs, and parts of the victim's bodies or eat parts of the victims, wear their skin, or show parts of victims' bodies to later victims. The trophy is meant to give the murderer the same feelings of power he experienced at the time of the kill. The last phase is the depression phase. A victim, now killed, no longer represents what the killer thought he or she represented. And the memory of the individual that tortured the murderer in the past is still there. Famed FBI agent Robert Ressler compares the murder to a television show with no satisfactory ending because the serial killer experiences the tension of a fantasy incompletely fulfilled. In each subsequent murder, he attempts to make the scene of the crime equal to the fantasy. Norris notes that there is an absence of the killer's sense of self, and during this phase, 
the killer may confess to the police before the fantasies start once more. However, because victims are not seen as people, recollections of murders may be vague or viewed as the killer having watched somebody else. They may have a memory for tiny details about the murder, which is dissociated from the event as a whole. Just as with mass murderers, serial killers are broken down into several categories. These typologies are based on motive and not considered official classification systems. The visionary is told by hallucinations or delusions to do something. They have a break with reality. Sometimes they believe they are another person or, or are compelled to murder by entities such as the devil or God. The two most common commands are demon mandated and God mandated. For example, David Berkowitz or the son of Sam and also known as the 44 caliber killer is an American serial killer and arsonist whose crimes terrorized New York City from July 1976 until his arrest in August of 1977. Shortly after his arrest in August, Berkowitz confessed to killing six people and wounding several others in the course of eight shootings in New York. He has been imprisoned for these crimes since 1977. He subsequently claimed that he was commanded to kill by a demon that possessed his neighbor's dog. Some other examples include Herbert Mullen, who killed 13, shot most of them. He claimed the voices told him to shave his head and burn his penis with a cigarette, which he obeyed. The voices also told him to kill in order to prevent a catastrophic earthquake. Then there is the mission oriented. These individuals are not usually psychotic. Rather, they feel a need to rid the world of the immoral or unworthy, such as prostitutes, homosexuals, women, etc. One of the most infamous mission oriented killers was the Green River Killer, who was Gary Leon Ridgway. He was convicted of 49 separate murders and confessed to nearly double that number. He murdered numerous women and girls, most of whom were alleged prostitutes, in Washington during the 1980s and 1990s. He earned his nickname when the first five victims were found in the Green River. He strangled them, usually with his arm, but sometimes using ligatures. After strangling the women, he would dump their bodies throughout forested and overgrown areas in King County, often returning to the dead bodies to have sexual intercourse with them. The next typology is the hedonistic serial killer, who simply gains pleasure from the pure act of killing someone. The victims merely serve as enjoyment and a way for the killer to fulfill their needs. This category can be further broken down into lust, thrill, comfort, or power seekers. With serial killers motivated by hedonistic lust, sex is the primary motive, whether the victims are dead or alive. Sexual gratification depends on the amount of torture and mutilization they perform on their victim and they also tend to display an inordinate degree of bizarre aspects to their killings, which defy any degree of rational understanding. For example, Jerry Brudos kept the foot of one of his victims in the deep freeze to periodically take out and dress up with his collection of black stilettos. Douglas Clark kept a victim's head which he cleaned and made up with cosmetics in order to use it in sex acts. Kenneth Bianchi, one of the Hillside Stranglers, murdered women and girls of different ages, races, and appearance because his sexual urges required different types of stimulation and increasing intensity. Jeffrey Dahmer searched for his perfect fantasy lover, beautiful, submissive, and eternal 
As his desire increased, he experimented with drugs, alcohol, and exotic sex. His increasing need for stimulation, stimulation was demonstrated by the dismemberment of victims, whose heads and genitals he preserved, and by his attempts to create a living zombie under his control by pouring acid into a hole drilled into the victim's skull. Dahmer once said, quote, lust played a big part of it, control and lust. Once it happened the first time, it just seemed like it had control of my life from there on. The killing was just a means to an end. That was the least satisfactory part. I didn't enjoy doing that. That's why I tried to create living zombies with acid in the drill, end quote. He further elaborated on this, also saying, quote, I wanted to see if it was possible to make again. It sounds really gross, uh, zombies, people that would not have a will of their own, but would follow my instructions without resistance. So after that, I started using the drilling technique, end quote. He also experimented with cannibalism to ensure his victims would always be a part of him. He stated, quote, after the fear and terror of what I had done had left, I started it all over again. From then on, it was a craving, a hunger, end quote. The hedonistic thrill killers do it just for the pure fun of it. Thrill is made greater by inducing pain or terror in the victim. They tend to be sadistic and brutal. For example, Robert Hansen took his victims to a secluded area where he would let them loose and then hunt and kill them. Ted Bundy once said, quote, you feel the least bit of breath leaving their body. You're looking into their eyes. A person in that situation is God, end quote. Bundy once described killing as a need. In the 1970s, he raped and murdered young women in several states. He confessed to 28 murders, but some thought he had committed hundreds. He was executed in Florida's electric chair in 1989. His charm and intelligence made him something of a celebrity during his trial, and his case inspired many novels and films about serial killers. As for comfort killers, they enjoy killing for what it can bring them, in a material sense, such as money, business, or elimination of competition. Their main objective is comfort and the good life. Usually the victims are family members and close acquaintances. After a murder, a comfort killer will usually wait for a period of time before killing again to allow any suspicions by family or authorities to subside. They often use poison, most notably arsenic, to kill their victims. Female serial killers are often comfort killers, although not all comfort killers are female. Sometimes comfort killers are known as black widows, lethal caretakers, and cost cutters. For example, black widows tend to kill husbands, lovers, or relatives for financial gain. They're almost always women, and almost 90% use poison to kill their victims. Examples include Diana Lumbrera, who killed her six children for insurance, a nanny, Hazel Doss, who killed four husbands, two sisters, and one mother, Lydia Trueblood, who killed four husbands, one child, and a brother-in-law, and Amy Gilligan, who killed five husbands and several patients. And then there are the power seekers who desire complete control and power over the life and death of others. Many power or control motivated killers sexually abuse their victims, but they differ from hedonistic killers in that rape is not motivated by lust, but is simply another form of dominating the victim. Bundy and Dahmer are also both fell into this category especially considering Ted Bundy traveled around the United States seeking women to control. Let's take a closer look at a power seeker. I'm sure all of you can remember the BTK Strangler, or Dennis Rader. He was born in 1945 in Wichita, Kansas, with three brothers. 
He was in the Air Force for four years and then moved back to Kansas and started working with ADT Security Services. He then later became a compliance officer. He also led a Cub Scout group and was very involved with his church. He was part of the congregation council at his church, actually. Over the span of 31 years, he killed 10 people and managed to keep the police off his trail. He bound, tortured, and killed his victims, hence the alias BTK. All of the murders took place in the 70s, except for one that was in 1986. In an interview, he described the process he went through when deciding to kill Nancy Fox. He stated he was just driving around and saw her walk in her house and thought she could be a t potential project. He said he did a little bit of homework, checked her mail, and figured out where she worked just to size her up. So the night he planned on doing it, he parked his car three or four blocks away and went up to her house and knocked on the door. She wasn't, so he walked around back and cut the phone lines and walked in the house and waited until she got home. When she got home, he just told her he had sexual fantasies and it was a problem. She got upset, and then he had a cigarette with her, and they talked for a good amount of time. According to him, she said, let's get this over with so I can call the police. He then handcuffed her and tied her feet together with pantyhose, then took off his belt and strangled her. Then after she was dead, he took the belt off and retied her neck with pantyhose. Then after he finished retying her, he masturbated to the scene of her like that. He eventually wrote letters to the police in order to piss them off. In one of his letters, he said, They were very lucky. A phone call saved them. I was going to tape the boys and put plastic bags over their head, just like I did Joseph and Shirley, and then hang the girl. God, oh God, what a beautiful sexual relief that would have been. Josephine, when I hung her, really turned me on. Her pleading for mercy, then the rope took hold. She helpless, staring at me with wide terror fill in her eyes, the rope getting tighter and tighter. At the end of his letters, he would tell them he wanted a name because all serial killers needed a name. So he named himself the BTK Killer. Find them, torture them, and kill them. Let's look at some examples and see if you can classify or identify the type of serial killer. So this would be an example of a hedonistic killer. Let's try another one. This is an example of a mission-oriented killer. Let's try another one. This would most likely be an example of a power-oriented kill. And last one.
This would most likely be an example of a visionary serial killer.